Synthesia was founded in 2017 with a mission to become the first platform for synthetic video creation. On their platform and with their API, anyone can generate professional looking videos. Some of the coolest projects they did so far were having David Beckham speak nine languages to launch Malaria Must Die voice campaign, Lace Messy Messages, in which fans could create and send personalized videos from Messi, and the deepfake adaptation of Snoop Dogg music video from Just Eat to Manilock, Australian version of the app. I was lucky to get my own Synthesia avatar, and you may have known it by now. Today I have a pleasure of talking to Victor Riparbelli, the CEO of Synthesia. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for showing up, first of all. I know you're a super, super busy person, so I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, sit down and chat with me a little bit. Um, if you'd like to give me a little bit of a background on yourself, that would be awesome. Yeah, definitely. And thanks for inviting me. Excited to, to be here. So, so I'm Victor Rubelli, and I am the CEO and, uh, and one of the co-founders of Synthesia. Um, it's easier we help our customers make, make awesome video content without the need for cameras, microphones, studios, and all those things you usually would associate with, uh, with video production. You simply go to a website, log into a web app, select an avatar, type out your script, add some text and some shapes and some images on your video if you want to, click generate, and then you have a video that looks more or less like a real video um, in, in just a matter of minutes. And my own background is, uh, so I'm from, from Copenhagen, Denmark originally. And I think my path to kind of starting Synthesia probably began in, in my childhood. Obviously, like a massive sci-fi nerd. Uh, I think you have to be to start a, a, a deep fake company. Um, kind of slowly got into tech in my teens. Uh, my first like uh, real business, I guess, was was creating like websites for local businesses and in, in, in the area and things like that. Graduated to the Danish kind of startup scene and found myself in in product and growth roles. So uh, I am kind of half technical. I can code a little bit, but I'm, I'm pretty bad at it. Um, but I love to be kind of in the middle of commercial, technical, design, sales um, discussions. And I think doing that for four years kind of was a pretty good preparation for starting my own company, which I always knew that I wanted to do. Uh, so when I got back to studying in the US, uh, I knew I wanted to start something. Um, but I also knew that I was not super passionate about building accounting tools and those types of, of, uh, of, uh, of businesses that I've been part of in Denmark. I wanted to do something more kind of uh, sci-fi frontier tech. So I moved to London and to make a very long story short, uh, along with two professors, Professor Matthias Niester and Professor Ludus Agapito, initially kind of got the idea for Synthesia. So Matthias Niester, who is my co-founder today, he is, used to be a professor at Stanford. He had done most of the seminal research in what most people think of as deepfakes. So uh, the research papers that emerged in like 16, 17, he's done kind of most of that work. And when I saw that work the first time, I of course also saw, you know, this is kind of scary. What can people do with this if it gets into the wrong hands? But I think more than anything else, what I really saw is that this is a paradigm shift that very few people right now probably think about. But I think it's going to change the entire game, right, in terms of how we actually make content. In 10, 15 years, our hope is that we can create a Hollywood film on a laptop without the need for anything else in your imagination. I think it's one of those things that kind of, it probably sounds a little bit crazy right now, but if we zoom out a little bit in history, right, it, it might not be that crazy. Uh, I have a hobby as a music producer. And if you open up a MacBook today, you can synthesize audio effects, instruments, drums, whatever you can think of and create a chart topping hit, right? That was, would be sci-fi 30, 40 years ago, right? Uh, we can type text on a computer. We can use the backspace button if we write something that we want to change. Like most other types of media have been digitized. Video hasn't been yet, outside of Hollywood at least. And in that, that way, I can just see this as like the next natural evolution in, in media. And that got us really excited. And that's, uh, that's how we start the company. Okay, that sounds super cool. So uh, let me, let me uh, follow up on this um, sci-fi component. So you like i'm curious about your approach so uh, on the one hand you're looking at the uh, research being done and the amazing cap capabilities of neural nets coming out of the uh, research facilities on the other you want to have a little bit more of an exciting world um when where, where did the avatarized 
you know, AI people came into the picture. Yeah, so I mean, it all started with a general idea that neural nets would fundamentally change content creation and video production in particular, which is what we we what we're working with today, right? So directionally, I would say that we kind of knew we would one one day end up with the product that we have today, but it was of course a very kind of zigzaggy journey getting to where we are today. We've gone through several chapters of the company where the first stage of this, when we found the company back in in 2017 was just like, can we actually make something that works and can produce photorealistic videos uh, to some extent, right? Most people think that, you know, they see a YouTube video of a, a deep fake or research project and that it's like solved. I have to remember that research papers, they run the thing a million times and they pick out the one time that it actually worked. Building something in reality is a very, very different endeavor, right? So once we kind of had the first version of technology, which allowed us to, uh, to take a video and edit it, and uh, then the question was, how can we put this into a product that can scale, that we can offer someone to use uh, really easily? And there is a very critical path here, I think, where the kind of natural path would have been to essentially create a visual effects tool or plugin, right? That's the kind of, if you just sat down with the technology we had and was like, how can we build a business around this? Uh, and let's sell it to Hollywood. And I think had we done that, we would have maybe been mildly successful, but that was definitely kind of like the wrong choice. What we instead wanted to do was say, how could we give what is essentially you know, super high grade visual effects tools to the everyday person to help them make more content, right? And that took us down the path of making something that scales. And that led us to the text to video uh, technology, which we have today, where you literally just type it in uh, and we'll get a video out on the other end. Um, so I'd say like that's kind of where that emerged, right? We knew we needed to do something which was easy to use, which was scalable, and which we could see could become a, a really big business. And had we gone down that like Hollywood entertainment route, we could probably have done content which objectively would be kind of better quality and look more real, but it would have been super manual, right? It'd been, you know, a tool that someone would need to sit and spend hours on perfecting like just one single video. And that's certainly cool, but I think with these technologies, the exciting thing about them is all the new things they enable that could never be done before, right? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And another thing I think is that um, have you gone the initial path, you'd have ended up with a tool for professionals and um, in in the shape where Synthesia is today, you empower everybody, basically. Like you don't have to have any sort of skills and uh, you're yeah. able to put together a really nice uh, presentation uh, exactly. based off of your platform. Yeah, that's and, it. And I think this is this is like when you when you when you build a company, a new product, right? I think it's it's such a fundamental thing because had we gone down the route of selling to professional to video professionals or visual effects professionals, you give the technology to them and they see all the faults, right? They see, oh, it's not perfect. The lips are not perfect. There's some artifacts around the chin, things that no no person who's not a professional would ever notice. And when you give the technology to someone who is a business analyst and is used to creating PowerPoint decks, now they can create video, you're giving them a limitless world, right? Like they are so amazed by what they can do with this product. And that's really important when you go to market, right? If you're fighting against people who are perfectionists and know their field, are amazing at what they do, but they see all the flaws, versus people see all the opportunities, right? Um, and I think that's no matter what product you're building, uh, is, is something that's really important, right? When you when you take something to market. Business is going to really not it. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, so tell me if you can, of course, and to, to the extent that you can, uh, how do you use AI in, in Synthesia? Well, so, I mean, from a high level, right? It's, um, I don't think it's a, it's a secret kind of like what how, how this stuff works. You have, uh, you have a component of this, which is generative adversarial networks or GANs that I'm sure your viewers are familiar with. Um, the way it works is basically create an avatar of you. You have your own avatar already, right? So you submitted four to five minutes of footage of you. And what we then do is we input that to our system. It analyzes all of that footage and it basically trains a system where we can then reproduce that video, but where you're saying something different and all of that comes from an audio signal, right? Uh, so that's kind of fundamentally how it works in terms of like under the hood, I obviously like can't say like too much, like exactly how we're doing it. Uh, there's a lot more to it than just neural networks is maybe one thing I can reveal. I think a lot of people try to do these things end to end with deep learning 
that rarely really works. It, 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 you take, they're just not mature enough for that. If you want to do something that scales, is fast, and looks good, you need to do a lot of things under the hood, right? So what kind of looks simple and looks like something, I could maybe find something open source that can do this. There's a lot that goes into it. And that's also one of the big lessons, even for me, right? I haven't built a deep tech company before is, it's very, very, very different building a product than it is to prove something in a research lab. Got it. So, um, like, I got my own avatar thanks to you. Thank you so much for it. That was a super, super fun uh, experience. And a couple of comments that hit me was that um, people were assuming, without knowing what the process was, that I have gone to some specialized studio of yours. You have used some super high tech cameras on me, you know, multiple cameras, and you were filming me for hours to arrive at this effect. And when they heard that, it was just like a um, few minutes of footage that I have done together with a friend of mine that has a pro, pro camera, they were amazed at that. So um, like, I think this, this type of like, uh, what you can achieve with that simple input is uh, a really good statement to this incredible tech that's, um, that, that your guests are using. It's, it's really, really, really exciting for people. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I think the democratization aspect here is really important, right? Like uh, the kind of Hollywood style way or visual effects style way of doing this would be, as you say, right? Lots of, uh, you know, arrays of cameras, and uh, like a really long involved process. The key thing here, right, is that we want to make it easy for people to use and that it should be something that you don't even need to be a big company to use, right? You can pay $30 a month and you can get started with it. Um, and that's a, uh, that's that, that's something that's really important to kind of like how we how we build the product. So, um, what was the most challenging so far when building Synthesia for you? Everything is challenging. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think you know when you build a company, there is always a lot of challenges. Uh, they of course change over time. I think. Go back to like the beginning of building Synthesia, right? Like the really hard part was convincing people of a future that at that point seemed very far away and very vague um, without having much to show for it. That's, I think, quite particular to building a deep tech company. Like if you're building a, a traditional SaaS app or fintech company or something like that, you could generally spend a few months building a prototype, getting someone to use it, uh, maybe even launch something. And kind of slowly get going, get some proof points uh, that people are interested in it. And it's also very importantly, much, much, much easier for investors to understand, right? Everybody understands that uh, using your traditional online bank is not a great experience. So if someone can make that into an app that's nice to use, okay, that, that makes sense. When you're talking about this type of stuff, right? Most VCs and investors have never recorded a, a video before, so they don't even know how hard it is, which was actually quite interesting. Um, and secondly of all, it's kind of PowerPoint slides, right? Like it's me and a bunch of smart people with a good idea, but there's no validation, right? This is literally like a bet on us building the future and at least running in kind of like the right direction. And that is just incredibly hard. And I think um, we're not the first ones to go through this, but it is really hard, especially if you're not like a previously exited founder with uh, you know a Stanford Business School degree or something like that, that they can at least kind of hold on to, then, uh, then it's quite hard. Then from there on, right, it's, it's everything about a startup is finding product market fit and it takes a lot longer and you're a lot more restricted in what you can do when you're building deep tech because it's not just about, uh, not that building web apps is easy, but more or less anything you can think of in a web app, you can probably do, right? Whereas if we were like, okay, great, we can find product market fit if we can just make the avatars laugh and smile and be happy all the time, for example. Um, then that's a great insight. But the problem is that that is a fundamentally unresolved research problem that potentially could take five years to figure out. So you don't have time for that, right? So you're working with kind of a lot of constraints in terms of how much flexibility is there in like the product you're building and what you can do in a relatively short time frame, and who is the market that you're building that product for. And that means it takes longer. It is a lot harder. But when you hit it, it's also much harder to replicate for potential competitors and you'll have like a massive leg up in the market. <coughs> Excuse me. So they, they, those are probably some of the, the hardest things, right? It's just like making people believe in you 
um, so that they will hopefully invest some money because it is expensive to build deep tech companies. And then it's working with that kind of added constraint of building something that is that is um, that is deep tech. Thanks for it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I, I think uh, many early stage founders will um, kind of find their own story in what you were mentioning, um, especially when it comes to deep tech, because the, the development, um, the early R&D takes longer uh, to take it to the market. And uh, uh, yeah, it's a lot of pressure <laughs> from uh, from all uh, sorts of uh, directions coming at you. Um, but you guys are doing great. Um, so when it comes to the product market fit, um, you have definitely um, right now focused on creating the sort of this sort of like uh, lightweight uh, business tool for people that are uh, creating presentations. Uh, it's very intuitive. The platform it's like super easy to make presentations. First of all, like it could easily be a separate product where you just like have no idea how to make compound slides and and the platform helps you with that. So you put a lot of effort into that, which is great. Um, how do you see kind of the the road from here to, um, you know, building Hollywood films on laptops? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good question. I mean, I, th I think in the current use cases we have um, and product market fit we have, there is still a very long way to go. Right. So I mean, you've used your avatar. Uh, there is still a lot of things to do on the AI side and just making it more realistic, adding in emotions, body language, gestures. Um, I think if, if, if I look at one of the videos that you have done with your avatar versus one that you've done with your camera, they still look quite different, right? And <clears throat> let's be honest, if it's a 10 minute long video, the one you shot with the real camera is probably more engaging. So there's a path just kind of getting to that. I think the question becomes maybe more in three or four years, once we've kind of really nailed like what I think of as business communication, what do we do from there? Um, and I don't think I have all the answers. This is a space that's, <coughs> sorry, that is uh, that is evolving all the time. And I, 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 I fundamentally just don't think we know exactly what synthetic content is going to look like in three or four years. Uh, it'll probably look different from what we thought. It's always the case with these new technologies, right? Like I usually use the example of uh, like live streaming video over the internet, which not that long ago was actually like a, a really big technological feat, right? And once that was kind of built, WebRTC was was out there. You could relatively easy build an application that could stream live video for free from any device. No one would have thought that it was going to be Twitch, where people watch other people play computer games. That would be the ten billion dollar use case. That is totally non obvious, right? Um, the guys built Twitch found some amazing insights when they launched Twitch first, and they took it in that direction, which was a great choice. But it's a little bit like the same with synthetic content. Like we definitely have very strong product market fit in what we're doing today. But I'm sure that especially on the API side of things, once it starts to pick up, we'll figure out some probably like kind of weird use case that people just love, right? And then we'll move more kind of in that direction. So I try not to be kind of too prescriptive about the future. I do think there'll be a point where as we move away from having like presenting kind of uh, talking head style videos into like having 3D environments, several people on screen, more kind of entertainment-ish type of, of content, that that's probably going to be a separate product, which is going to look more like a very simplified game engine than it's going to look like uh, a PowerPoint app, which is, which is kind of roughly what our product today looks like. Mm, totally. So um, I was kind of looking at uh, at Synthesia in in these two ways. So on the one hand, was trying to create some um, more more of a professional presentation for my project. On the other hand, was uh, I was also testing it for YouTube um, as a creator, and uh, yeah, it was like two different, very different things. And I found myself um, kind of being a little bit more hungry for. All these elements that you mentioned, like uh, more emotions, uh, like b better, better expression of emotions in the avatar, because I feel like mm, that, like that's part part of the joy of of watching YouTube, of be of being on YouTube, that it's very uh, loaded with emotions. So, so yeah. uh, as a creator, I definitely can see uh, like how how it can evolve into that direction. But yeah, I, I totally understand that then you would consider it a separate um, a separate product. And I think it's also, there's a f something fundamentally interesting, and I think that's actually why 
what we're doing is working so well, which is that <clears throat> obviously, as we talked about before, right, if you compare it to like a normal YouTube video, there's still some way to go for sure. But what that's actually not what our customers are using it for, right? What our customers are using it for is to replace text. <clears throat> and that's very different, right? If you are someone who works in a big company and you have to go through lots of trainings, do you then want to read 10 pages of PDF documents? Do you want to watch a two minute synthetic video? Then it's a very, very easy choice, right? Whereas if it's, do you want to watch the synthetic YouTube video or the real YouTube video, you'll definitely take the, the YouTube video. So it's, it's a lot about like how you position the product and what are people actually using it for. And I think it, it goes a little bit back to what I said before about new technologies kind of almost needs to be used in new ways. It's like if you're taking a technology that's really transformational and you're just trying to optimize a process that already exists, it, it might be a route to market, but you'll never do something truly big or amazing with it, right? You're going to have to think of that whole process and think, okay, if we can input this transformational technology, can we rethink who the user is, what the UX is like, what the use cases are, and then it becomes really interesting, right? There's no big uh, transformational tech company that has been built on just saying, oh, people were doing it like this, and then we changed a little bit of the process, and then it became 10% easier to do, right? I think that's something that's very important as an entrepreneur. It's like if your idea is not, or your implementation is not to some extent weird or feels kind of like odd, you may want to rethink it. If you're just doing exactly, if you took like a thousand middle managers, big companies who works in innovation or something like that, and asked them, how would you implement this technology into uh, the real world? They would probably all just go with like the easy answer, right? Which for us would be like, oh, we'll replace video cameras. And that's not how people are using it, right? So then you would start to build something which would be directed towards people who know how to operate a camera or people who are experts in Adobe Premiere. And then you could end up with something that might work, right? Or these visual effects artists. But I don't think you would, uh, you wouldn't be able to create like a truly, uh, a truly transformational product. You'd just be optimizing a workflow, right? That already exists. And that's, that, that's a danger. I, I really love how uh, open you are when it comes to uh, thinking thinking about what Synthesia can become uh, in the future as well. Um, so it's probably been like a crazy process for you, like for for uh, most of the founders um, building it, up, ups and downs, uh, lots of joys and then some, you know, uh, huge dangers on the road that you had to put up with. Um, what were like the big um, lessons for you from that process so far? I think that uh, I think there are lots of lessons <clears throat> and there's a lot of obvious ones. So I think one of the obvious ones is like persistence, right? Which is very hard, but you kind of just need to keep on going on and believing in it. Um, things just take time and it is just ridiculously hard the first year of a company. Like, And I think it is for more or less everyone who tries to do it stick in and and like continue until you know that it's not going to work you can pivot or something like that most people never get to build a company because they give up right they make an initial powerpoint presentation they show it to their mom and their friends and they say oh what a great idea and then they call up some company and they say no we don't want it you really have to be persistent that that of course means you need to believe in your idea deeply and i think that is very important also it, it's kind of obvious but there's a lot of people who get ideas they think can make a lot of money they think will work, but they're not really passionate about them. It's going to be very hard to stick it out with an idea that you don't, don't actually love yourself. Then the other part of it, I've touched a little bit upon it, but I think creativity. Um, <clears throat> no one has ever built a company in an obvious way. There's no handbook to building a company, right? If you read business books about entrepreneurship, business in general, they all boil down to the same 10 lessons. They're good, but they're not going to instruct you how to build a company. Read them and you know absorb the lessons. But it's almost like you want to make sure that you are creative as per what I said before, right? If you're doing things that it's obvious to do, it's kind of like seems like the natural thing to do, you're probably doing it wrong, right? And the way you would, you would do it in a big company. For example, a lot of, of founders, I think, has this propensity of like, when they have to do something, they start making slides. And slides is not a product of, that's like your thinking on paper. It's great if you're convincing investors, you definitely need it. But... You know, it's, it's not a product in itself to do slides. So be very aware of what you're doing and are you doing something that feels uncomfortable and something that feels a little bit weird uh, would be my advice. Uh, it's kind of another way to think of it is like, if you're like, you're trying to figure out how do I grow my company? I have a product, I need to get it in the hands of people. 
I'll buy Google ads or Facebook ads, right? I'm not saying that that's not going to work for your company, but you need to be a lot more creative than that because outside of maybe a few cases, you're not going to be able to scale that and, and, and really kind of create that force of nature that a really successful company with, with strong product market fit is if you're just doing those very simple things. Experiment with many different ways to grow and then you'll find something that fits exactly your company, right? And that will be your superpower. And there's... There's too many obvious and kind of, you know, annoying uh, startup lessons here, but, you know, Dropbox had the referral thing that just worked for them. Uh, Airbnb had this thing where they sent photographers into people's homes to make them look really nice, which increased the conversion rate. Like there's all these like hacks that you kind of need to figure out and they're all non-obvious, right? So make sure you're not just like trying the same thing over and over again. Awesome. So um, that on the business side of things. And what about uh, your perception of AI and like where it's going and what, what it can do. Does it change over time with with the more and more experience with building a product based on deep learning? I mean, I think there's so much opportunity <clears throat> in AI right now. Um, I think some of the pitfalls of AI, right, is, is trying to apply AI to things that definitely does not need AI. I think that's a sickness you really need to avoid. Um, don't get excited about the technology, get excited about the problem you're trying to solve. And if AI is the right tool to do it, then you should definitely do it. But think deeply, right? Think twice. Is it actually the right thing to use uh, to use AI? Just a good example of this, I think there was a, a company at one point that had this virtual assistant. So if you want to, we, we need to schedule a meeting, you and me, Sandra, and I have this like AI virtual assistant that I CC in and they'll pass the text and figure out like, when can I have a meeting with you and all this stuff, right? And it kind of sounds cool. Didn't really work that well. And then someone invented Calendly, which is just the link that you click on and you can see the times that I'm free. You, 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 you click and you input a time, problem solved, $10 billion company, right? And it's like, it's one of those things where it's easy, of course, in hindsight to be like this, but there was no need for, 30 PhDs to sit and spend that much time on doing some really, really advanced NLP when you could actually just send people a link they could click on and it would be just as fast, right? So make sure that what you're doing um, works. Also make sure that the if you have something that works, that it can scale. That's something I see a lot of people hitting. Um, for example, people who do medical AI with um, uh, radiology and things like that. Like that'll definitely happen, right? But it's really hard because every radiologist annotates uh, pictures in a different ways. So what I've heard from some people, right, is that you actually have to train specific neural nets for every single hospital out there. That becomes really expensive. You have to get the data from every single hospital and train a model just for them. There's like all these complexities that you need to think about in terms of like the cost, not just in like dollars to train neural nets, but also very much in, in, in gathering data, which obviously is like the backbone of, of, uh, of most deep learning, right? So be, be hyper aware of those things. And I think as always, like, just be like hyper aware of the things that are the obvious pitfall for what you're doing. Right? Focus on those and really question yourself if it's, uh, if it's the right thing to do. And then figure out what you should build yourself and what you should use other people's tech for. Um, there, are, there are some you know, brilliant technical people who think that they need to build everything from scratch because no one has ever encountered exactly this version of the problem that they're trying to solve. That might be true, but if you want to go to market, then focus on building what you build best and then figure out what other kind of Lego blocks you could put together um, to get to market fast and start learning most important, right? Then you can always replace those blocks down the line if you have something that's working, but, um, but, but don't get obsessed about building everything from scratch. That's also a mistake I see quite often, especially with founders who are coming from a, maybe more like a PhD, or like a science background and don't have that much exposure to kind of, uh, you know, product, for example. Mm. I also uh, see it in the founders that are very technical and uh, have this um, kind of uh, um, philosophy that they can build everything, kind of. They can, they can, they're able to build everything from scratch because kind of everything but, um, boils down to code. Uh, so they go on and uh, build things for them instead of um, investing in something that will just uh, remove another headache that's just not your core focus. Um, exactly. 
awesome, awesome um, insight. So uh, I wanted to also uh, know your opinion about uh, kind of what will happen with the traditional media. I participated in your discussion with uh, head of AI, I think, at BBC. I know that you have been doing some projects together as well, which sounds very exciting. Um, what is your feeling of um, the traditional media's uh, you know, sentiment on on um, technologies like Synthesia and uh, kind of where it's, where it's heading there. So I think it's, it's going to be one of those classical examples where they will not adopt these technologies until it's too late. Right? Um, and I think it's, it's very, very classical um, new technology, you know, coming to market where and I've talked a lot about this, right? But it's for us, for example, it's, it's a, the kind of core user is someone who's never produced video before and they're just excited about being able to actually produce video right it's not a journalist in a broadcast tv studio will have a million questions about um all different sorts of things it doesn't look like the way it's supposed to look and, and, and this stuff so i really think it's going to be more kind of a grassroots movement type of thing where the, the new content formats will be defined by by the internet right not by like big uh, news media organizations and then once it's kind of more obvious what the use cases are then they will probably as laggards like slowly start to offer um, that type of content to be very concrete i think the opportunity here is 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 again right it's not replacing the six o'clock news anchors it's enabling the six o'clock news anchors to deliver every single piece of news that the bbc um, has on their website as text as video as well because today they have to pick out whatever 10 most interesting stories of the day and they can present those in six o'clock news. What you want to have is a TV channel that just has everything as, as video content and in many different languages and things like that. So I think it is a very, it's going to be like a very additive thing where it's going to be again, less about replacing the existing thing uh, and more about um, transforming like the text asset they have today into, into, um, into video and audio for that matter, right? So to that, that would be my, my, my concrete bet on like how it's going to play out. But again, I think we are pretty far away from traditional news starting to offer synthetic video. I can however tell you that there's a lot of smaller newspapers um, and media organizations. Very interesting enough, those have, who have never produced video before ever in their entire history, who are actually picking up the platform and are now starting to create video content. And I think that that just speaks to the point uh, I, I had before, right? Um, this is going to be driven by people who see all the exciting new opportunities for things they could never have done before. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, very exciting. I think, um, like especially when it comes to these languages, like being able to create more um, more uh, interesting content in terms of just like v visual appeal that you are able to engage with this avatar. Um, that, uh, I mean, it's like a totally different experience to listen to somebody telling you something and uh, reading something, like it resonates differently, it sticks in, the, sticks in your brain differently. And also I saw these uh, two really cool use cases you had with, uh, campaigns you had with David, David Beckham, uh, the malaria campaign, and also Messi for Lace. Can you tell us a bit about what is brewing under the hood of Synthesia currently? Like, what new exciting things can we expect uh, to happen soon? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a, a lot of what we're focusing on is, is building our creation tool um, that you've also used yourself to really just make it easy to create good looking video content. There's still some way to go there. We're, we're constantly pushing out uh, new stuff there. On, on the bit more kind of exciting AI stuff, it's um, the next iteration of the tech is going to be out pretty soon. And that's going to uh, enable essentially uh, emotions, head nodding, upper body language, taking the kind of realism like a few degrees up from what we have today, where it's obviously is kind of pretty one dimensional. You can't really do much to edit the video, right? You just put in the text and the video kind of comes out. Uh, that's obviously like a big piece of work, especially working on the constraints of like working with relatively little video footage, uh, you know, being able to synthesize like the entire body is, is, is a different uh, kind of challenge. But that is now ready internally and should be out pretty soon. And I'm pretty excited for what we're going to see when, when this drops, right? Because I think every time we increase the realism, kind of unlock new use cases. 
and it's always exciting to see what what people will then be building. Nice. Um, so I have a, like a random question. I just thought of it. Um, is he, is the process of uh, of creating a video heavy for you, like on your end? Because uh, I remember when I was playing with um, with guns before, and when I was creating visual content, uh, it took me at least a couple of hours. Uh, and I just realized that when I was I was creating videos on your platform, it took me like several minutes. And especially when you're like, um, you know, using the 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 most cutting edge stuff um, to to create this amazing effect. Like, how how is that? working how how do you how do you achieve that and is it difficult <laughs> yeah i mean i can tell you that when we had the first like uh well version i guess of the pipeline running it took uh it took 40 minutes per frame which meant that every day we would, we would uh, meet into the office and we would have like two and a half seconds of generated videos of like that that we could look at and try to decipher if it looked good or if it looked bad so we've gone quite a lot of, of ways since then as with anything, it's a matter of focusing on it. Um, optimizing neural networks is a discipline in itself that I that I can't explain here on this call. Um, but it is again one of those things, right? Where building a real life product is very different than research. Because if it took us two hours to generate a video, I'm sure some people will still use it, but it would be a very very different experience. Like it, it, it's already now, even though it is very fast, we want to get it to real time, right? Because it's just going to make the user experience so much smoother than what it is today. Um, so that is also something we're working on, and I don't know when we're going to be real time, but it's not that far away. That's very cool. Very impressive <laughs> uh, from from my especially knowing like how painful it is to to train models. All sorts of models. I was trying like um, uh, with the with the with visuals, with audio, uh, with text. Obviously, with text, uh, especially when you have um, APIs like GPT three, uh, it's uh, it's uh, way easier to uh, to achieve this effect. Uh, but yeah, uh, it can be very painful sometimes uh, for for your hardware as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, actually, I w I wanted to ask about that. So one of the things that um, that uh, uh, took me by surprise is that people found this uh, marriage of uh, synthetic synthetic avatar with uh, synth synthetic text generated by GPT three very very compelling very very strong and and again like a like a powerful statement to what AI can achieve today. Um, do you think you will be experimenting a little bit with with text as well in in the future? I know that you already have some capabilities because uh, I was using my own audio and you're able to sync it so I can imagine you're able to transcribe it for example but um, yeah what's what, yeah. what are your plans there yeah so I don't think we'll ever go into um, like developing our own tech but it's very clear that something like GPT-3 is super interesting in terms of what we do right there is a bunch of kind of adjacent technologies and I think all these technologies, if we look at synthetic media as a whole, is kind of force multipliers on one another, right? Especially going back to that five-year vision of like, what is, what is synthetic content going to look like? It's not just going to be Synthesia, right? It's going to be Synthesia, it's going to be uh, OpenAI, it's going to be the voice cloning, it's going to be DALI, it's going to be GPT. All these different things combined in, in, in different ways will probably yield all kinds of very interesting uh, results. But for us, it's always going to be something where I mean, going actually to, to my point earlier, right? We're not the experts in text, but what we are thinking about doing is making integration with GPT-3, for example, so that you could have this kind of GPT-3 interface inside Synthesia and, and kind of build your queries there. And then of course the video could come up on the other end because there is something like fundamentally very, very interesting about it from obviously from the more, you know, like, uh, like sci-fi kind of cool, crazy creative stuff all the way down to, okay, hey, we actually want to turn these articles, or these blog posts into videos. Can we use GPT-3 to take an article, which might be pretty long, uh, summarize it in a two or three minute version, transform the, the language from, uh, from the written language to the spoken language and send it off to Synthesia, for example, right? That's, that's pretty interesting in terms of a very real business use case. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. We already have customers who use uh, the GPT-3 API combined with ours. And um, there are some, there's some pretty interesting stuff. So I think, I think, again, yeah, all these technologies will just be force multipliers 
they'll be able to do all kinds of interesting, crazy, valuable, and weird things. That's awesome. Oh, well, I'm myself, I'm going definitely to um, experiment with that more and uh, like push it to the limits and see how, how people feel about it. So far, they feel good about it. <laughs> so, far, <laughs> so far, they even like, I was surprised. I don't know if I'm myself not so expressive normally in my videos, but um, some people like for real uh, took the avatar and the text generated by the avatar as me. Uh, especially in the video where it wasn't introduced as my avatar when they yeah. like didn't expect if something like this was coming <laughs> and it was a little bit of a you know mind fuck for them to actually see that uh, so yeah I think it's uh, I it's, think it's, it's really it's, it's very interesting really how really... yeah I mean it's interesting how like with this stuff like the difference between if you're primed for what you're going to see and if you're not primed, right? So if you go to a website and get free video, you know exactly what you're seeing. So again, you'll also look, you'll see the flaws, you'll hear that it's a little bit robotic, etc. But if you just present it with a video like in the wild and no one is telling you that it's synthetic, uh, even if the lip sync's a little bit off, people just think that uh, probably something went wrong with the video rendering, right? Like you've watched tons of YouTube videos where the sync is a little bit off. You don't instantly go to, ah, oh, that's probably synthetic, right? Like where it does show is, of course, as we've talked about, right, the, the kind of not so emotional lack of gestures, those types of things. But it is it is quite convincing already. Uh, and that's also what we're kind of hearing, right, with, with our customers who are obviously using it in, in real world situations. Yeah. Gosh, it's uh, it's a super interesting area. I'm I'm very happy to um uh, to be able to learn a little bit more about you from it, and also to follow your your journey. Uh, it's definitely going to be very very exciting. Um, thank you so much for for um, spending the time with me and uh, for sharing all your thoughts on how it went for you to from from the ideation to where you're at uh, with Synthesia and what you think of, of um, all the aspects associated with it. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, we can wrap up. Unless you want to share anything with, with the viewers, maybe there's something, maybe I'm missing something. Feel free to, you know. <laughs> okay, so um, you're muted, by the way, right now. Yeah, classic. Um, <laughs> no, I think we... We, we, we covered a lot. Everyone is free to come to Synthesia, make a free video, try it out, of course. Uh, but they probably already knew that. <laughs> yes, I'm going to I'm gonna link it below. Uh, I even created a referral referral link, so I started uh, making making money out of it. I actually started, like somebody signed up from my refer referral. Uh, <laughs> our, our is a, is a, is a diff difficult <laughs> sound to make. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for showing up, uh, for sitting down with us, and uh, I hope that's not the last time I was I managed to catch you. And uh, yeah, all the best with uh, with developing Synthesia. Thanks, Sandra. Speak soon. Bye. Bye bye.